make me wonder as to what is happening. Yeah. So you all set? You ready? We're, we're, we're going live now. Yes. Yeah. Well, good afternoon to uh, those of you who are tuning in on Facebook or YouTube right now for our weekly live Q&A. And uh, my name is Jim Washock. I'm the Communications Director here at West End Assembly of God. And it's a pleasure to come back to you at our typically normal time, unlike last week, at uh, 3 p.m. Tuesday. Uh, for those of you that were able to watch the live last week, I hope you really enjoyed that special edition as we got to talk with our youth pastor, John Kelly, as well as a couple of youth, and uh, take a trip of, uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, as to what it meant for them to be engaged in a whole week of Lift Up RBA projects, uh, which culminated this past Saturday in a general church-wide event at East End Cemetery, which was really, really awesome. Uh, but I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that at a later point in time. For those of you that were able to catch this past Sunday's sermon, uh, you know that with uh, Shane being away in Germany right now on a two-week missions trip and family slash family vacation, uh, we had a special speaker as well. So I'm here with our pastor for our Latino service, who's usually in the fellowship hall uh, delivering sermon in there every week, was able to step away from that and come deliver a sermon to all those that are in the gym in the sanctuary. So Pastor Moises Diaz, it's awesome to have you with us this week. Thank you, it's my Q&A. blessing to be also with you here. Very good. Um, and for those that don't know, the Latino service here at WEAG, I think officially got started, or officially with a venue in last October, November, something November. like that, right? Yes. But you, you were actually doing Friday Night Worship and so forth well before that. Mm-hmm. So how about roughly how long has that been going on here? Now? Well, we've been so blessed to have the opportunity to minister to our Latino uh, people here and we are. Yeah. And uh, yes, in last November, we launched the Latino ministry here. So, which means we started a Sunday mm-hmm. worship service. Yeah. And uh, so people are so excited coming to church and, you know, so, and, yeah. and worshiping God in their own language. So we've been blessed to have that opportunity. Absolutely. It's pretty awesome that at uh, under one roof, there's three services going yeah. on simultaneously. <laughs> Somehow we're pulling it off. And um, if we need to do a fourth service, we're in trouble because yeah. we're running out of space. But uh, we'll make it happen if we need to. So, um, uh, Pastor Moyes, a lot of folks that are tuning in may not be uh, familiar with your background and how you became involved in WEAG and so forth because you're in the fellowship hall and they're in here or in the sanctuary getting the English version of the sermon every week. So I'd love it if you could just um, help our viewers out by telling them a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, your family and so forth, where you're from and such. Well, I grew up uh, in in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was part of the uh, generation that grew up in the midst of the communist uh, system. Um, so, back in Cuba, we um, we have the opportunity to minister under the Assembly of God. Okay. Uh, really, I had a calling on my heart since I was a little boy, five years old. Yeah. Uh, as part of the transformation that God, by His grace, uh, did in the life of my father. Mm-hmm. So, at the age of five years old, I told my Sunday school teacher, uh, when I grew up, I want to be a, a pastor. Okay. So that kept me in my, in my mind during all of my years. Yeah. So I was able to finish my career, mechanical engineer. And uh, But after that, when I started working, then God called me into ministry mm-hmm. and reminded me the thought that I have for all of those years and say, hey, this is the moment that I really want you to serve me full-time ministry. Yeah. So we started uh, a full-time ministry and uh, a, a revival starting in, in Cuba. Um, 90% of the pastors at that moment were people who, like me, uh, were prepared for to serve the communist government. But now, God called my generation to serve in two ministers. So we, we just say yes to the Lord and started uh, planting churches. Uh, mm-hmm. As a result of that, uh, I, married, I married my wife and have a two daughters and, and, and a son. Okay. But as a result of my ministry in Cuba and the growing of the congregation and the revival, we start being persecuted and uh, uh, we had a lot of situation in our life. So at some point, God spoke to our life very clear. God uh, really used a prophetic uh, ministry to just tell me, I'm going to open door for you in Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to save your your family, 
but Canada would be only a bridge for you to go to U.S. because I'm going to open door for you. Okay. So we just follow, we just obey God. He made a, uh, in, in a miracle way, he opened door for us to fled Cuba mm -hmm. to, to Canada. Even the government of Canada and the United Nations get involved in our situation. They mm -hmm. were able to take our children out of Cuba and reunite our family in Canada. Oh, wow. Once awesome. we were there, <coughs> then we I started serving the Assemblies of God in Canada. So we also planted a, a church uh, over there, mm -hmm. um, but always reminding the leadership that I had a call to come to U.S. So then I started traveling, visiting different churches here in U.S., and the Assemblies of God asked me why not to, to transfer my credential here to the to the Assemblies of God through the Potomac District Network. Mm -hmm. So we, we did it. Uh, we moved the whole family and uh, we start ministering in Northern Virginia um, uh, temporarily because we know that God was about to open a door for us. Yeah. So we were like uh, for a lot, about two years and a half just praying to God. Yes, we were serving, ministering, preaching, but looking for that door. And I think that um, that's why we are right now in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. The Potomac District uh, asked me why not to consider uh, Richmond as an opportunity for you to plant a church and uh, also to help us with all of the ministry uh, to all Hampton Road, Virginia Beach, and all that southern area. So mm. we, it is amazing because I was in, in Miami, Florida uh, with a lot of families and pastors and there was a family who attended We Act, oh, and yeah. um, they moved to, to Florida. Yeah. So then I opened my heart to them, and they said, oh, I used to go to Western Assembly of God in Richmond. Mm -hmm. They would love to have a Latino ministry there. Why you don't contact them? So uh, then I sent an email to, I think at that point was Amy, something like that. Yeah. Um, and then got made uh, you know, opened the door for me to meet Pastor Hirschman at that time and also Pastor Shane. Mm -hmm. So it was when the, we are, West Saint was in the middle of the transition from Pastor Hirschman to Pastor Shane. And I just found how uh, Pastor Shane's heart and my heart and our vision for the Latino was on the same page, on the same tune. Nice. So we knew at that moment uh, that God was connecting us. Yeah, yeah. We didn't know at that time how, but we were sure that uh, uh, it was in God's divine appointment for, for our lives. Mm -hmm. And from that point, here is uh, history. So we being blessed in, on believing on God. So we moved our family here. Uh, God opened door for, for us. Our children were able to go to the uh, college and university here. and. Uh, also to to be involved in the <clears throat> in the life of, of the church yeah so and um so we've been here just obeying god's prophetic word in, in our family okay very good that's uh, amazing that uh even though you were here in virginia northern virginia you were in miami and bumped into folks yes. that used to go here until they moved out of state and that's what made the connection to that's we how had. god made yes it is, it is amazing yes. how god will work isn't Amen. it that is for sure um I'd love to find out from you, now that you've been doing this in conjunction with Pastor Shane and WEAG, the WEAG community, for a while now, the Latino service and so forth, if you could give folks that may be unfamiliar with the Spanish-speaking uh, population and culture mm -hmm. that is it was within our area here, um, what is the size of that? What is the needs of that population? What is it meant to you to be able to have this uh, opportunity uh, and be able to host that right here within WEAG? Yeah, we just, uh, when we started thinking and praying about Richmond, mm -hmm. we started doing some uh, search <coughs> about the population, about uh, the people, even the churches here, uh, Hispanic churches here in, in the city of Richmond. Yeah. We just found out that there was uh, more than almost 150 small groups that called themselves like a church. But also I found out that I asked the question, why so many small groups? Yeah. And uh, somebody told me about split divisions. So at that moment, I knew that there was no a good, relevant uh, church in the city of Richmond that can really bring 
like uh, we've been speaking, uh, uh, a message of grace, mm -hmm. uh, so we can really be open to receive any people from any backgrounds. Um, and that's why we started looking at that. We found that uh, we have on in Richmond, all the surrounding areas, uh, more than 60,000 uh, Latino people here. Yeah. So we knew at the moment there is a really an open door for us to reach out to the Latino. Yeah. The other thing is, um, even though we are really open to receive everybody, we also found out that there are many Latino people who um, are more educated, more professional, who are now visiting churches because they want to keep the culture, they want to keep the language, but they don't feel fit in any of those small groups because mm -hmm. of the traditions or legalism, whatever. So now that we are bringing the, uh, the mes message of grace, we've been seeing those kind of people coming to church. Right. And great testimony, m many of them say, for the last six months we didn't visit any church, but now we feel that we are in the right place. Yeah. So, and, and that's what motivates us you know, to, to do what we are doing now. It's been a, a process. We are just laying the, the foundation mm -hmm. to making sure that it's going to be built out of the grace of God. And, um, and also, it's been a, a great journey for us to also uh, help the English-speaking side to make the transition together. Mm -hmm. So instead of mm, reaching out the Latino, at this point, we've been also trying to, to make a, a smooth uh, connection and flowing with the flood of God and what he's doing here at Guiad and also in the, in, the, in the city of Richmond. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for those insights. Certainly appreciated. And uh, if for our viewers, if you have additional questions beyond what I just asked for Pastor Moises, I certainly invite you to use the comment area to go ahead and ask those. And in a moment, we're going to dig down into the sermon, but I do understand that we have a question. And so we do want to pause for that and make sure we get that one in. So Pastor Shane is actually tuned in. All right. Oh, Hi, goodness. Pastor Shane. He is Hello. before he loses connection. <laughs> so he has a couple of things he's interested in. The first is this. First, he wants to say a wonderful sermon on Sunday. Um, and then here are the questions. Um, I'd love to hear more about how important it was to find an environment of grace when you moved to Canada and mm -hmm. then to the U.S. Mm -hmm. as someone from another country. So how did grace kind of yeah. get involved with that how, process? How important was it to find an environment of grace mm -hmm. in Canada and then in the United States as you were making these transitions? Okay. Right. So that was the first one. And then the second one was, I'd also love to hear more about your father and his dramatic transformation in Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that struck grace a chord. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that struck a chord with me as well, because my introduction, I witnessed a uh, change in my mom, and that's kind of what, what Well, Pastor Chang, first, uh, we are going to charge you for those two questions, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, so, what I found the, in, in, in Canada, first, um, we were obeying God's uh, will for our life. Yeah. He was very clear in asking us, that Canada okay. would be only a bridge for us. Mm -hmm. um, but also the population in Canada is very small mm -hmm. uh, in comparison with the population here in in, in US. Right. So the message of grace was already in us because we were coming from the revival in Cuba. And in, in, and it started all in the testimony that mm -hmm. I shared with you. Mm -hmm. That moment started my, my ministry. Uh, you know, based on the grace of God. So it's, it's in us, it's what we are, what we preach, how we live. So we just come to U.S. thinking we will have more opportunity to share that heart, to share that message of grace that God has put in, in our life. And also, it's also coming because uh, you ask uh, uh, Pastor Chen, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, yes, my father was uh, really... Uh, the, the living example that I had in, in, in my life. In fact, when I was in the fourth year of the university, I was confronted by a communist uh, professor uh, who trying to put in doubt uh, my, my faith. 
as you know, all the communists, they are faith, they, they are unbelievers, they don't believe in God. Um, instead of me trying to preach a message to him, I use my father's transformation as the power of God to show him uh, the grace that he had with my, with my father. Because I, I do believe that the only proof that the unbeliever has uh, and the, the, only, the only proof and the only way they can know who God is and who God says he is, is only by observing our life. It's mm -hmm. only by knowing what, it, what God is able to do in the life of people. And that dramatic change is only through the blood of Jesus. Um, and I remember that at the end of that conversation, that man was touched by that. And, and in fact, uh, that man, uh, I think after I graduated and after the, the, the revival in Cuba, he was a member of the My Father and Lord Church. And uh, he always remembered that conversation that we had in, in that moment. It was really a challenging for me mm -hmm. because I could lose my uh, right to stay in the university because, you know, it was a, a conviction moment where I just need to, I cannot deny Jesus at that moment. So, um, but I was able to connect the transformation of my father um, really as a way to show who God is uh -huh. uh, for those people who don't, who don't believe. What was, uh, for those that didn't know, might have missed the sermon on Sunday, what was the evidence of that transformation in your dad's life? Because I, I know in the sermon you alluded to your dad struggling with alcoholism, mm -hmm. and so I imagine that was part of the transformation. But were there other things as well that made it very clear how God had impacted his life so dramatically? Yeah, uh, well, uh, by comparison, I saw a man who came to my house uh, every day drinking, mm -hmm. uh, drinking, uh, hitting my, my, my mom. Mm -hmm. And then now as a little boy, see the transformation of that man. It wasn't from one day to another, it was a process. Sure. But it was good for me to be uh, that transformation in, in him. Now when I, he used to drink, it wasn't like before he gave his life to Jesus. Yeah. He tried to hide, he tried to hide himself so people don't see him because the Holy Spirit was convincing him that now he's a child of the most high God. So yeah. I was able to see that transformation, but also because he's the one who teach me to love to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. He's the one to love me and, and, and lead my, lead my, my life, you know, to, to serve God. And, and so that's why I think he's a, a living example for, for my life. Okay, very good. Well, I've got a few questions for you about that kind of dig deep into theologically as to like what grace is and then moving on to um, how we actually apply grace in our lives. But again, I do want to take a quick moment just to remind our viewers that it, do you have questions about this past week's sermon, please use the commentary to get those questions in while we're live with Pastor Moises. Um, that would be great. Uh, one thing that I, th I think that I've, I've gleaned over the years that I, I think people kind of get kind of curious about when, especially when they're looking at Old Testament versus New Testament, which you alluded to in the sermon as well, is if, if, if grace was God's end game all along, his plan all along, why would he create so many rules and commandments only to then have to extend grace for our inevitable breaking of those rules? And to us, it doesn't seem to make logical sense. Uh, what are you, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, I think uh, okay. it's a very, very good question, mm -hmm. Jim. And um, uh, I think the, the first uh, misconception uh, about grace is just, it's hard for us to understand that because something is free, it doesn't mean that they have no requirement. Let okay. me put it in this, uh, in this way. There are many things in the Old Testament that are transferable to the New Testament. Mm -hmm but it's brought into a new system, into a new way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing also that we need to know is what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What is the, when, when God told Israel about keep my commandment, my statutes, what God really was saying is my commandments show you my moral character yeah. and I made you to my image and to my likeness. So. In the Old Testament, you have to do it to please God. But now you do it because you want to 
uh, you want to be, you want to be conformed mm -hmm. on who he is mm -hmm. and uh, living a principled life uh, uh, um, made us, you know, to live closer, closer to God. So um, the problem that the Israel had was when God gave them the Ten Commandments, if you see the context, God is saying, I brought you into a freedom. <coughs> uh, I brought you from, from the slavery yeah. into freedom. Now, these are my commandments. Mm -hmm. This is the way that Israel um, uh, got that. Okay, God, you just brought me uh, from a slavery system on the, the Egyptian and brought me into another slavery system called law. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that they had. And that's the problem that we also have. But if we see the law, if we see God's principle as the boundaries mm -hmm. for our life, uh, as the, the, the point of reference in our life, instead of the, 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 the things to do to please God, yeah. But they are the boundaries that create the, 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 the environment in which we have freedom. Yeah. You see? They're there for our own good. Yes. Yes, for yeah, sure. And it's for yes. our own good. Yes. So then God say, look at this. By the human ways, mm -hmm. by the human effort, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you grace. It's not great for you to stay in sin. It's, it's great for you to be like me. Yeah. In order for you to live as I, you know, uh, uh, because this is the way, this is my principle, this is who I am, that's the way God say. If you do it, it's going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. But I know that you cannot do it by yourself. Then let me give you the power. Let me give you, uh, you know, the grace mm -hmm. that you will need in order for you to experience that freedom within the boundaries that he has put. Gotcha. to save us. Uh, one thing that kind of resonated with me when you were delivering the sermon this Sunday is that uh, grace isn't just about forgiveness. It's not just about a <coughs> touchy-feely way to kind of get along with one another yeah. and along with God, but that it was more fundamental. You even talked about establishing a culture of grace as being necessary for us to have a proper perspective of other people's circumstances and other people's lives and of, of what God is doing. Um, so my question with that is, how, how do we then, how fundamental is it for us to properly embrace grace in order for us to have a much clearer perspective of other people's lives so that we can serve? Um, well, I think uh, that I, let me let me answer by explaining two things that I think is important. Sure. You are talking about how we can get the proper perspective of yeah. God and others people yeah. so that we can serve. Uh, there is a there is a connection between the anointing and the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So the anointing is the power to know. Grace is the power to do. Okay. So which means is. We can only get the, 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 the proper perspective of God and other people mm -hmm. by the anointing because the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates, based on the Word of God, who God is, mm -hmm. what are the people are, how we need to love our neighbor. Now that we have the knowledge based on the Word of God, then we need grace, we need the power of God so that we can only don't have the data or the information, yeah. but now we have also the power to do what we already know based on the uh, uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So we cannot uh, disconnect, you know, the Word of God, God's principle in our life and the Holy Spirit from the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So everything flow. In, in, in that way. So the anointing and the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to teach us. So we get the knowledge through Him, but we do it through the power and the grace of God. Yeah. That's why so many Christians know many things, but they don't, they don't put in practice. They don't do it. They just listen. They just are aware of the knowledge, mm -hmm. but not uh, able to do it because what we need is also uh, the grace of God. Mm. So who we are, who God is, 
everything comes not from the cultural perspective, not for somebody else's opinion, but what God says about, about us. And I think that that's important that we know how grace works sure. in conjunction with the anointing based upon the Word of God. It sounds like the humility of forgiveness is integral to us being able to experience grace. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, and this is, this is the process, uh, Gene, that I, I believe is shown in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, according to Romans 5, we are justified by faith. So, so this is, this is the, the first step that, that we do, is just coming into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Because I think there is two, um, two perspectives on this. The grace of God that saved our life, you don't have to do anything. You don't have, when we, when we say we don't need any requirement, we are, we are meaning that moment of our life. No matter who you are, no matter how lost you are, mm -hmm. by the grace of God, we are justified by faith. Now, now that we are in the kingdom of God, then we have the boundary, which is all God's principle in our life. Then we need the grace of God so that we can really function and we can be like God yeah. only by His, uh, by His power. So basically we ask forgiveness to be able to receive Jesus Christ in our life mm -hmm. and be part of the, of the body, be part of the, uh, of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. But then we operate under the ruling and the governing principle of God that is no longer under the law, but under the grace. Yes, there are many things, principles, who are brought to here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's been taken in another way because it's a new system. Let me put it in this way. Yes, we have the Ten Commandments. How Jesus transferred those Ten Commandments and the whole Old Testament into the new. He just say, love God, yeah. love your neighbor, yeah. and love yourself. Yeah. So he it's just summarized yeah. you know, in, in a simple way. Why? Because it's a new environment. Mm -hmm. It's a new way that we need to uh, operate. One, uh, one other thing you mentioned in your sermon where you kind of connected to establishing a culture of grace was here at WEAG how essential it is for us to be uh, a multicultural, multi-generational church that's even able to lift up RVA is by having grace, embracing grace, and extending grace. But I want to ask you, for many of our viewers, this one, they don't work in the church. In a church you're only in for so, such a minority of your week. Would you say that grace is applicable to the business world too, that most people find themselves in most of, the, most of their time? Um, and, and, and if so, how is that the case where in the business world typically self-performance and ability are heavily me measured and, and heavily emphasized? Where does grace live outside of church, basically? Well, I, I would say, Gene, it's important uh, to mention two things okay. and to separate two things. One is in the spiritual. Okay. How we as a Christian uh, can be productive, spiritually speaking, mm -hmm. is only first we need to we need to have the Holy Spirit, which means we are believing in Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit with us. Mm -hmm. So the only way that we can really be uh, spiritually productive is through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So which means I need as a believer know what is my spiritual gift, and then consecrate and, and use it for God's glory. Mm -hmm. that, that's important. The second thing is the natural. So, and, and that's the problem that we have. I'm gonna show you why, because uh, naturally you, let me put it in this way, it's not that you don't need the Holy Spirit, but in the natural, you are productive if you live by God's principle. Okay. And this is what happened. Even non-believer can, can have a, a productive life, yeah. naturally speaking, not spiritually speaking, but because they are, even without knowing, they are obeying God's principle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the only way for us uh, is to distinguish between uh, when we are um, um, functioning based on our talents and ability, and, and when we are serving in God's kingdom, uh, through the gift, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And let me put an example. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say we have somebody who has the ability to teach, right? The problem is that sometimes people in their mind 
think in that in this way. Okay, since I graduated, since I working as a teacher, then it means that I have to teach in the church. Uh -huh. That's my ability. That's the good thing that I can do. Then I just say, hey, I am a teacher. Uh, if you need me, I can teach. It doesn't work in that way because probably in the natural, your talent, your ability is to be a good speaker, teacher in the professional world. Mm -hmm. But now your gift is serving or your gift, your spiritual gift is a, as an exhorter. Then probably you have to find uh, within the different ministry on the church how your spiritual gift can really function in a way that you will have the grace of God to really work for God. Okay. So that's, that's the, the difference. There are many people who say, for example, Pastor, I'm a mechanic. Yeah. If you need anything, if you break down your car, anything, that's the way I serve God. So what they are saying is, yes, it's good thing that you are doing, yeah. but good works imply good things, but connected to the gift that God has given to us so that we can really maximize our abilities, our talents. So that's why it's critical to help our people identify uh, their spiritual gift. Yeah. They already know what are the talents. They already know what they, uh, their ability, human ability. But now, what is the real calling of God? Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a special example in, in, in the Bible. I think it's Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul was a good teacher. Paul uh, was called to minister the Gentile, not the Jewish. Mm -hmm. But then Paul sometimes said, let me go to Jerusalem. This is a wonderful message I'm going to bring to the Jewish people. I'm going to do what happened to Paul. Nothing. Mm -hmm. He wasn't productive in Jerusalem because he was operating out of the place, the time and the gift that God has given to, to them. Okay, very good. Well, I had a couple more questions, but I believe we have one from the viewers, so we want to definitely put theirs uh, in, 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 in place, make sure we get that in. So in relation to that, Megan Carter asks, how can you help out in the community other than through the church? Hmm. This is part of uh, manifesting the spiritual gift, spiritual productivity. I like how you worded it that yes. way. Uh, how can we utilize that um, in our community, even outside the church? Yeah, um, I, I think if we just want to help the community, uh, you know, uh, but I, uh, I've been making a difference between good things and good words. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I see is we, we have to see that serving to the community as an opportunity to get in touch with people, yeah. as an opportunity to live our life in such a way that people can ask us, why are you doing this? Why are you volunteer? Why mm -hmm. are you serving your community? So I would say that um, serving in our community or in, in, in our church, we in the church minister to the saints, also to the uh, non-believer. When we go out, then we need to live our life in such a way that we uh, can make them uh, wonder about why you are doing this. Mm -hmm. So I see that as an opportunity. Um, every good things that we would do, if we see as an opportunity, then that good things becomes good words. Because I, in my mind, thinking, okay, God, I'm serving my community, but I have the faith, I have the conviction that you're putting me here because you will give me the opportunity to be a witness of Jesus Christ for the life of somebody else. Okay. If we are just doing good things and we are not thinking that way, we don't care about the, 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 the way we are living, the, our lifestyle, mm -hmm. then then could be a good thing, but not a good word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how about, in closing, how about here in the church, as stewards of grace, how might we aggers further uh, be or better support uh, with grace the variety of guests, groups, and services that we have here? So, because we are we are a very diversified church. I think uh, I present in my message that grace should motivate us. Yeah. Uh, because I, I live in that kind of environment, it's hard for me to think in a Christian mm -hmm. that is not serving God in one way or another. Mm -hmm. it, it is really hard because if you re are really grateful for everything that God has done in your life, really, really, what I say from from my heart, the least that we can do is just to call uh, a leader or church saying, 
how can I help? How can I really serve God? Is all of our life is just coming to church, you know, probably giving offering on tithe, but that's not all. Yeah. God put a gift in all of us, and He is expecting us to serve Him as an appreciation. Not because you need to gain. We don't. We don't work to to, to gain grace. Mm -hmm. We work because of grace of God. So, and that's I think that's part of my DNA. Uh, that's what I encourage to my family, I encourage to my people, Latino people, and to everybody. It's serving God. And let me tell you something, for all of my year of experience, Jing, Jing, this is what I can tell you when I've been counseling marriage, couples, family, situation. This is what I found. Those who are serving God have more the probability to get on track and really uh, get out of that bad situation than those who are just complaining, yeah. uh, you know, disconnected, not serving with the church, um, because it's not in the way they are expecting to do. It, no, it, we just need to say, God, I'm doing for you. Yeah. Yes, it, through the church, but I'm doing for your glory, I'm doing for your honor. So, uh, and that's my encouragement to, to all people. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Well, I know we went a few minutes over than our typical, uh, we try to keep these at half an hour, but this was excellent. Thank you so much. It was so great to learn more about you, but then also delve so uh, deep into your sermon and, and pull out nuggets that we can apply to our daily lives through it as well. So thank you very much for that. And we thank our viewers for tuning in uh, as well. And uh, next week, we will not be doing a typical Facebook Live. Uh, we're looking to bring you a sneak peek as to what... Uh, what VBS, Vacation Bible School, is like here at WEAG. So stay tuned online for that. You'll be getting more information about that as we move into next week because Vacation Bible School is very important uh, for us here at WEAG. So we want to give you a glimpse into that. Um, and uh, be sure to tune in at 10 a.m. Uh, this coming Sunday for our next, uh, this will be, I think, episode six of City on a Hill. And uh, Nikki, do you know what hill we're featuring this coming week by chance? I put you on the spot, sorry, without Union Hill, Union Hill potentially. All right, all right. Um, so tune in for that at 10 a.m. this Sunday, either on site here or online, and we'll catch you live in a couple weeks. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.